Thank you, first of all, for, for, the, for the introduction. And I'm quite sorry I could not uh, make it. Um, uh, it's a real honor to speak, and uh, especially on the initiative that we're doing here in Abu Dhabi. So I'm chief researcher in Abu Dhabi, and for many of you, maybe you don't know, Abu Dhabi is going through a, a transformation from uh, what we call an oil-based economy towards a knowledge-based economy. And we're trying to invest the maximum as we can in the technology, and especially in mathematics. And we've put into place uh, something called TII, which could be something similar for many of you as what we call the Fraunhofer Institute, although Fraunhofer is more network than, than a single institution, or in Riyadh, for example, in Europe, or, or KAIST in South Korea, with basically people doing applied research and using mathematics at the heart of what they're doing. Uh, of course, the breadth of topics is very huge. I'll be talking mostly here because of the session is related to AI, on things that we're doing, of course, on the AI realm with mathematics, but also on the telecom uh, uh, part. So just a, a little joke as an introduction, of course, uh, mathematics has much more role than just using an AI. And uh, it can be even used as a travel insurance. And it's quite known uh, that uh, Hardy was already, uh, at least the great British mathematician Hardy, was using it as a trick before uh, going uh, on traveling whenever the weather was not good, on which basically he was uh, posting a, a postcard on which he announced the solution of the Riemann hypothesis, just in case, or at least he found, uh, the Riemann hypothesis uh, in case uh, that he could not make it. And of course, if he could make it, then no problem, he would destroy it. And if he did not, then people would at least consider that uh, he was uh, the author of this Riemann hypothesis because of course of his, uh, what he says, that God with whom he waged a very personal war would not let him uh, uh, die with such a glory. So that's quite an interesting joke in, in what we're doing. Second thing I wanna, I wanna say is that uh, the topic of this session is very good because today mathematics is playing the role of physics of the 20th century. And uh, this was a study already made uh, in 2009 by the Wall Street Journal. It was still conducted a couple of years after in 2014 and even now. And the, uh, I would say that the, uh, the job of mathematicians still ranks within the top at the moment in, in the industry, which showcases also uh, the kind of, of, of requests that we're getting in terms of having uh, more candidates and people with some kind of mathematical training and this, of course, AI is absorbing that, but we have also a lot of other disciplines on which we require that kind of logic and that kind of skills. Uh, and of course, you can see also the kind of worst job that uh, is considered actually by, by candidates. Uh, when we talk about mathematics, uh, there's a lot of things. I'll be talking here about mostly mathematicians around the ICT, and of course, the well-known that uh, have been impacting. And uh, then I'll be focusing more on what we do here at, at, at TII. Of course, if you consider the, the giants on which we're relying at the moment in terms of evolution, many of the breakthrough, I would say, fundamentals were done around 1948, meaning uh, uh, around uh, basically the last century. And this goes, of course, with the work of Shannon, with his famous, I would say, Bell Labs uh, 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 um, writings, to, uh, and which triggered the field of information theory. Alan Turing, of course, with everything which is related to AI, Norbert Wiener with uh, basically his book on signal processing, which has of course had huge impact in the field of uh, ICT, especially in all this complexity reduction algorithms. And John von Neumann also basically with respect to different aspects related to game theory, but also what we call the von Neumann architecture, which is the heart of how we do computing. Now, what's happening today is quite interesting. And I think, uh, a lot of the work that Shannon has been doing was related to a model in 1948, which expressed what I put here as Shannon 1.0, and in which the objective at that time was mostly to transmit a bit from one uh, 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 direction to the other direction. And this has led to a lot of progress related to the work that we've been doing around 5G, especially in our institute. Today, what we're seeing is more what we call convergence of communication and computing. And the model is changing in the sense that uh, we have much more capability than just the model that we had, because a lot of the transmitters and receivers that we're designing have also what we call storage capability and also computing capability. And once you do, do that, the idea that um, is pushed actually now is not anymore to uh, transmit data from one point to the other, but to connect intelligence and to build a network. And this is the kind of work that we're doing at the moment here at TII around 6G is what is the kind of network that enables us to build a context between the transmitter and receiver. Because here what happens is that the more you communicate, the less you need to communicate after. In the classical sense of communication, 
you don't store the past. By storing the past, of course, you start building what we call a common understanding between two entities and you go on. This is a point that Shannon had already, by the way, highlighted related to, to a notion of called semantic communication, where your goal is not anymore to transmit bits reliably, but to transmit the meanings of those bits. Because what you want to transmit is not basically just the data and raw data, but what you have learned from that. And a lot of work that is being done today, today in uh, the evolution of what we call beyond 5G and 6G systems is exactly that we know that we will have more and more provisive AI going on. And the network that we need to build is not a, about just uh, connecting different entities, but connecting the intelligence with those entities. And this is the shift that I'm talking here around Shannon 1.0 to Shannon 10.0. Of course, on the theoretical side, there's a lot of work on defining what is what we call semantic information on which we're working, but also the coding aspects of that, what we call semantic codes. The same thing as you all know, within the Shannon realm, in, in 1948, Shannon had developed basically his information theoretic concept, but it took us more than 50 years to develop basically the coding schemes or the algorithm, which can achieve those kind of limits. And here we are in the same setting, where we are defining basically the protocol to be able to connect those intelligence and then developing basically the kind of uh, coding schemes which enable to benefit from the fact that we have computing and data storage nearly at each point. Second thing also, which uh, is a big game changer today and is related to uh, Wiener is the mathematics of control. Today, I think you're all aware that in the system that we're building, a lot of the things now are being computed at the edge. What I mean by the edge is the devices that you all have, and on which now a lot of learning or machine learning systems are running, especially deep neural networks. Running a deep neural network on the device basically uh, is a big hassle, and mathematics there play, play a very important role. By the way, the movement from the cloud to device has many origins. Uh, one of the origins, of course, is all the privacy constraints that we're having the latency issues that we're having in the sense that we cannot bring back the data up to a centralized cloud, but also coverage issues. And on top of that, we have, of course, realized that also from an energy efficient point of view, it doesn't make any sense in a network to move the data back and forth to take decisions. Now, if you start running basically uh, a deep neural network on a device, the classical type of neural networks that are built today are not tailored to that. And I can give you a very specific example if you start doing what we call sensors or Internet of Things. The problem of training in general is a problem of optimization. And optimization in general, well, if you do what we call a gradient descent, requires some kind of derivative. However, if you lower the precision, basically, of your weights in a neural network where they take only 0 and 1, you cannot do any more any kind of uh, derivative. And there, of course, when you have your you constraint, your resolution of your weights within a de device because of the complexity to, to very low resolution, then the gates are quite open on how you do combinatorial op optimization. And this is the kind of things where we've been building a lot of what we call binary neural networks to solve those things. But that's only one part of the story. The second part of the story is that we start building today the network of the future on which these devices need to communicate with each other. And the question is, when each of these devices start having, or each part of a network, or each basically surrounding of your network, start to have a deep neural network, how does the system behave? In the classical game theoretic setting, this has been already approached. For people who are familiar with game theory, when you approach the context of saying that each device has some kind of rationality, and the kind of metric or utility function that you try to optimize has some good properties, then you can show some kind of convergence properties of your system. In the case that I'm talking here, you cannot. This is called multi-agent deep reinforcement learning. And on which today, uh, we are building basically some kind of mean field multi-agent deep reinforcement learning to start understanding how such a system behaves when you have, of course, a process of feedback and there's interactions between the different devices so that the system gets stable. And this is, of course, also the kind of systems that are being built not only in networks, where we're starting to put more and more intelligence back to the device and having more what we call user-centric decisions. Mathematics, of course, is at the heart of this because you need to start to build a lot of algorithms. And uh, within the range of algorithms that you can imagine, they're quite huge. And as usual, 
Today, within this control loop, you have issues related to under the, the classical understanding of how you can go and maximize a certain utility, which is in general either the rate, some kind of coverage that you need to do within the setting. The third one I want to talk is, of course, the mathematics of architecture, which is also extremely important here for us. And what I mean by mathematics architectures is that for many years, we've been all building computers based on what we call the von Neumann architecture. And the idea of the von Neumann architecture is that, and you have it when you do what we call matrix multiplication, is that there is a clear separation between what we call the computing unit and the storage unit. And in classical computer in the von Neumann architecture, you spend a lot of time moving data to the computing and then bringing back the data where it was. And that kind of back and forth and transportation of the data, of course, has a huge hit on the capability of making things go faster. Of course, uh, it's been years that people have understood that you need to make things a bit more closer to what we call in-memory computing, where it's not anymore basically the data that goes towards the computing, but it's the computing that goes towards the data. How you build it, of course, there's many directions to do it, which uh, are still not easy. I give you a bit here a bit of the history of different directions in terms of going in what we call post von Neumann architecture, but these are only a subset of ways of increasing your speed in terms of having much faster computation. And we saw with the talk of, uh, of, of Demis at the beginning, how important today uh, in AI, the computing aspect is playing uh, around, around that role. I'll finish with the last one, which I think is extremely important for our community and for which we are also working here, which is basically uh, the mathematics of AI. I think uh, in, a subs in, 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 a, in, a, in a nutshell to explain rapidly and, 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 and my previous colleagues have been speaking around it. Well, I usually give to my student this example, which is quite easy. Here on the right, you have a guy called Newton that, that you're all familiar with. And on the left, you have what we call a ballistic tape. And I think with this example, you understand why we need new mathematical tools to go deeper in terms of understanding the mathematics of AI. When you want to do a ballistic kick, you have two options. When you give this to a student of the age of 18 is that he solved Newton's equation and he can find what we call the distance to kick with the angle. So he can find the angle and then the distance. Another way that you can do is basically the data-driven approaches, which are, we are using now. Meaning you kick the ball many times and you put it two columns, distance, angle, distance, angle, distance, angle. Next time somebody asks you to kick the ball at a given distance, then what you do, you're going to do a search and try to find if that distance is your data. This is called ABAX, quite known. And basically, you hopefully, you'll find the angle. Uh, of course, to do that, it, you need algorithms which can go faster than usual because you're not going to look at one meter, two meter, until that, that kind of distance. And you're going to clusterize your data. And one way of doing it, we have many techniques to do that. Where it gets interesting, of course, and this is where all the machine learning hype is there is today, is when, of course, the distance is not there. And when the distance is not there, well, what you do is some kind of regression, or what we call function approximation. And you're able, of course, to find right, the way to link x as a function of theta or theta as a function of x. And the problem is solved. And of course, you're able to do it. And today, we have, of course, architectures, neural network architectures, which can do you that function approximation very fast. Of course, one of the caveats that we have with, these, with this approach of replacing Newton's equation with that, of course, we can replace Maxwell equations with that. We can, of course, replace Schrodinger equation with that, is that you need, uh, of course, a lot of data to do that. And the second, of course, uh, that is also problematic is that when you have learned in certain conditions, it doesn't work for the other conditions. What I mean is that when you learn to kick the ball on, on when it was uh, sunny, you have, of course, an instantiation where you need to kick the ball when it's windy, and then you're stuck. So, of course, we've built up some techniques related to transfer learning that the community has built to try to move forward. But still, we need a lot of data to capture all the different situations. Second thing, also, I went quite fast in the example that I gave you, and we know it. I made a one-to-one -one link between distance and angle. In fact, the initial speed is very important. And this is exactly the work of data scientists today, is to be able to find the right column. And I have many of my engineers who have a lot of issues, especially when they start designing systems, in trying to find what is the right column and what is the right column 
to find the approximation because then you need a bit of prior information. But where I think is very difficult is in this example, and I like to give it, is how once you learn on Earth on how you can kick on the moon. The techniques that we have today, which are based on function approximation, cannot enable you to kick on the moon, whatever you learn on. And so it's not a reason related to AI, it's related, of course, to the way we do it. And one way of doing it, which has been at the heart of the work that we're doing, is to find what we call invariant properties in your data. And here, gravity is an environment, meaning if you start doing some kind of translation on your data, some rotation on your data, or whatever kind of topological kind of, of transformation, you try to find that gravity. And that's exactly where you're going to find it. No, how, I'll um, finish with that. And how you do it is not easy. Uh, uh, we're Erwan, working on that, but I wanted no. just to capture that kind of thing. Erwan, yes, I'm afraid your I time is up. I finished. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you very much for this talk.